So, hi, and welcome to the second of the July Monday night series. My name is Alice, and uh, I acknowledge the original custodians of the land on which we gather, and I pay my respects to their leaders, past, present, and emerging. So I hope you've all had a good week. Um, I've actually come from today. I had uh, I was looking after my <coughs> granddaughter um, from 8:30 until 5:30, so I've done a lot of play-doh and painting today. <laughs> Not much time for contemplation. Um, this session's going to run for about an hour and uh, we'll do some medit guided meditation, um, a talk on the topic, a little bit more meditation hopefully, and then there'll be time uh, for questions if you have any. And I invite you, as usual, to really try and relax and be comfortable and be at ease as much as you can. And it can actually be quite helpful to orientate your body in the space, which means that you, you look around and see the things around you, see the people around you, maybe acknowledge your neighbors and smile at them. Um, I was thinking about this, you know, we talk about our inter interconnection and we kind of come into the gomper and sit like this. Um, Geshe Doga, uh, who's our, our teacher here, um, quite often used to ask people to say hello to each other um, before he started. And uh, I think we, our society has become so kind of individual focused that it doesn't always feel very comfortable. But you know that thing in um, Christian church, I guess it still happens, where um, people turn to each other and say, peace be with you. I think that's... That's what happens, which is really nice. At least to have the attitude of um, may everyone in this room be peaceful. Um, so last week we began to think about ways in which we might encourage meditation to be a regular part of our lives, well, of our days. And we looked at a number of things, at the fact that we're all different, um, and so we need to be quite discerning in the way that we build a practice that works for us. Um, because clearly, um, you know, a, a mother of young children is going to have a practice that looks really different from somebody maybe who's living on their own and, and has not so much distraction. I remember it well. Um, I can remember saying to a friend, you know, bemoaning the fact that uh, my, well, I didn't have a meditation practice, I thought about it, but I uh, didn't really have one and that I'd never done retreat. And she said, Alice, darling, you've done the retreat of a hundred thousand kisses. So that made me feel much better. So yes, we need to find ways that make it work for us. And we thought about the benefit of bringing a kind attitude to our practice, an attitude of open-hearted inquiry and interest rather than bashing up ourselves up with shoulds. You know, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. So rather bringing an attitude of gentleness and self-compassion so that we might in turn be gentle with others. And we thought about our common humanity, our interconnectedness with other people, with other beings, with communities, our environment, because um, everything we do will affect the people around us and our environment. So I watched a TED talk last week, um, which was called The One Minute Secret to Forming a New Habit. <laughs> And the talk was given by a woman called Christine Carter, an American sociologist. And she said, she was talking about how motivation can be there when we begin something that we want to do. And it can be quite lively when we begin it, but um, it can kind of taper off and, you know, it comes and goes. Um, 
And research shows that we human beings tend to follow the law of the least effect, meaning we tend to do the easiest thing possible. Not everybody, but we tend to do it. Which is why we might consider doing something very modest to begin with, something that's so easy that we can do it every day. And this aligns perfectly with Geshe Doga's advice to begin with one minute of breathing practice, just one minute, and, um, and then build it up from there. And Carter calls it the better than nothing practice, which um, I quite like. And the goal is repetition, not high achievement. So we begin by watching our breath, for example, for a minute, and do it every day. It's the repetition that is the thing. It's like, um, I don't know if any of you have learned a musical instrument, but, um, you know, with piano, if you practice five minutes a day, there's a much better success rate than maybe doing an hour every two months. So by getting started like this, doing a short amount of time, but doing it every day, we're establishing the neural pathway in our brain for a new habit, which makes it much more likely that we'll succeed with something more ambitious down the track. And the reason it works is because when we hardwire a habit into our brains, we can do it without so much resistance and therefore without needing as much willpower. Willpower, you know, depending on willpower is a tricky thing. So a better than nothing habit turns out to be much easier to repeat again and again and again until it becomes an automatic part of the day because we can do it even if we don't really feel like doing it. You know, you can think, well, I can do it for a minute or if we're feeling a bit tired or if it feels like we don't have much time, we can do a minute. And then once the habit becomes automatic, and it does, that's the golden moment that then our habit can begin to expand organically. And I know that um, this approach, well, for me it has worked really well. I was, uh, about 20 years ago, um, I, had, uh, I was given a commitment to do a certain mantra practice, um, repeating sacred syllables. Uh, I guess the most famous one is Om Mani Padme Hung. Um, the mantra commitment I had was a much longer one, and um, it was to do 10,000. And usually you would do a 100 a day of any particular mantra. Well, I started this 10,000 um, 20 years ago, and I'd start it, and then I'd stop it, and then I'd start it, and then I'd begin again, because the thing is that if you miss a day, you have to go back to the beginning and begin again. So it's, um, who was that guy? Sisyphus, you know, had to push the boulder up the mountain, then it would roll back at night. Anyway, um, my friend who I mentioned last week, um, who has been really helpful with my practice, who's, she said, well, if you can't do 100 a day, how many do you reckon you could do? And um, a common, another common number um, is 21. I thought, no, I could, do, I could do 21 a day. And so it ended up taking a year and three months to complete um, the commitment. And it was easy to do, and I have to admit, sometimes it was in front of the telly, and, you know, sometimes it was in the car, but without fail, every day I would do the 21, and finished. And the effect on my mind for having completed this promise I'd made to a teacher, and um, having completed the practice was very, very positive, and actually led to, um, you know, my, my practice becoming more fruitful. So um, another thing we talked about was um, a practice in itself is setting our motivation in the morning. So doing something as Geshe Doga um, encourages to do, which is to think today I'm not going to cause harm to any living being and I'm going to help, help beings as much as I can. I mean, even having that attitude for the day is... Uh, of a profound kind of outlook on onto the world, and um, 
On Saturday, our oldest son came over for coffee and pastries, and he told us about a. Pra he's um, uh, he's a practitioner. He's a meditator, and he told us about a practice he'd been doing lately, where in the morning, he works out what he has to do that day, who he's going to see, what he has to do, and thinks of something that he can do to help or to give some happiness to three people, three specific people. And thinking about giving help to real people in our lives makes setting our motivation more personal, more specific, and actually much more powerful. Because thinking about all sentient beings can be a bit amorphous, you know, it can feel a bit impersonal. You know, it's like I, I heard some story about a woman who was known to have said, um, I have no trouble generating love and compassion for all sentient beings. It's my husband I have a problem with. So um, it can be something very simple like intending to make someone a beautiful cup of tea uh, or helping a colleague who you know is under the pump, you know, who's not managing um, or ringing your mum if you haven't rung your mum for a while and you know that she'd really love it even if you know it's going to be an hour and a half on the phone. Or taking the dog to the beach doesn't even have to be a human. Um, or ringing someone who's grieving. But just thinking of something simple that you can definitely do. Um, because you've set that motivation during the day and um, the people who are going to benefit know nothing about it, then there's no expectation of getting something back you know, of having something in return which kind of mucks up the whole system. And then having done the three things, or even one thing, you know, setting a motivation to help one being, then at the end of the day we dedicate that action to the benefit of all beings and go to sleep with a really happy mind. So there were some ideas from last week. So I think we'll do, before we go any further, we'll do some meditation. And we're going to meditate on the coming and going of the breath, as we did last week. This is such a, such a useful and beneficial meditation because you can do it anywhere and you don't need any equipment. You know, you just, just need your, your body and your breath and your mind. So remembering to put aside as best we can <clears throat> any thoughts, any pre preoccupations, worries about what happened, what's happened today or in the last week and um, any worries about what's going to happen tomorrow or in the coming days. We, we just put it aside for this r very short time and we know that we're in the Gompa we're in this very blessed place where many wonderful teachers have taught, where people have meditated together, and so we can really let go and relax. So I invite you to find the most comfortable position for you. We think about our posture and it actually reflects what we're doing with our minds. So. We have a straight spine as much as you can, even shoulders, hands in the lap, the chin slightly tucked which make, lengthens your spine and your eyes closed or just softly unfocused to the floor in front. And we can take the first moments to bring ourselves into our bodies we bring the mind home, as Geshe Doga says, and just consider what does it feel like to be me right now, right here, how am I feeling? Maybe tired, maybe happy, maybe anxious, doesn't matter, just notice it. 
and we think about a meaningful motivation for the practice. Maybe to reduce our anxiety levels, to feel more peaceful for a while, to become more patient, or to become fully awakened, to become a Buddha so that we can really be in a position to help. So what is it for you? What's your motivation? And then we scan our bodies briefly, letting our awareness be mindfully present all throughout the body. We bring awareness to the face, the muscles of the jaw, the temples. We bring our awareness to the forehead. Relax all the muscles. Allow the face to become soft and relaxed. And let your eyes feel soft. And bring your awareness to the shoulders. If you find any tightness or constriction there, we breathe into it and as you breathe out, relax the muscles. Surrender your shoulders to gravity. Intentionally relax your arms, let them be soft. Relax your wrists, your hands, each finger one by one. Aware of the feeling of air on your skin. And bring your attention to your back and the back of your neck. And notice if there's any holding on to tension there. And we breathe warmth into there and release the tension gently on the out breath. Letting the tension go. And you might notice that where we direct our awareness in the body, we can actually feel, we can sense that part of the body. And we allow relaxation to flow down through the front of your body, down through your chest, the belly, into your pelvic area, your hips, and being aware of any sensations here, allowing any tension to melt, be released. and bringing your awareness to your thighs. Aware of the muscles in the thighs, the biggest muscles in the body. Down through your knees, your shins, calf muscles, bringing your awareness to your ankles and your feet and allowing your feet which work so hard to relax and we consciously relax each toe
even the spaces between the toes. Really paying attention and allowing your body to release, relax. And now we allow our mindfulness and our breath to flow up through the tips of our toes, up through the body, out through the crown of the head completely releasing any tension that remains. So the body feels very clear and at ease. We allow it to be in a posture of comfort. And just abide in this awareness for a few minutes. Nowhere to go, nothing to do no expectations, just being with how things are. And we invite our bodies to be as still as possible, which leads to the stillness of mind. And if we need to move a little to be more comfortable, of course that's fine. And whilst we cultivate relaxation, we also maintain an attitude of alertness, of brightness and focus. So now completing this process, we take three slow, deep, gentle breaths. Breathing in, we might notice the air being a bit cool and then breathing out, we notice it's warmed by the body. So we breathe in and out three times. And we settle the breath now in its natural rhythm, just taking note of the sensations connected with breathing, wherever they arise. So see where the most vivid for you, it might be at the entrance of the nostrils, it might be the rise and fall of the abdomen, Notice where you sense the breath most vividly and this is going to be your object of attention. So we focus there. And we observe the entire course of the in-breath Breathing in, noticing from the beginning of the breath all the way through the in-breath to where it turns. And the entire course of the out-breath, noticing the pause at the end of the out-breath. So it's like our mind is riding the breath, completely connected. Breathing in, we know we're breathing in. Breathing out, we know we're breathing out.
And whilst we closely observe the breath, we don't try and control it, so we let the breath breathe itself. Then the body knows how to breathe. When thoughts arise to distract you, you merely notice them, not judging. Notice in a gentle way, being patient. Bring the mind back to the breathing. And if the mind wanders a hundred times, we bring it back a hundred times. If you find sound taking your attention, you merely notice it, merely sound, nothing else, and we bring the mind back to the breath. allowing the mind to rest in this moment of awareness. And we use the mental factor of introspection just to notice if tension has crept in anywhere in the body and to relax it again and bring the mind back to the breath. Just for one more minute, really focus your attention. Just breathing in and breathing out. Relaxed and alert.
And now we bring this short meditation to a close. So in your own time, you can relax your attention, bring your mind back to the room and if you need to rub your feet or stretch your legs or stand up or get a chair, whatever it needs. So last week um, someone asked if I could say something more about self-compassion. Um, and before we think about it, it might be helpful to say firstly what compassion is because Buddhism has a very, um, in Buddhism, compassion has a very specific meaning. Um, in this book, uh, The Fearless Heart, which is by um, Thubten Jimpa, who was His Holiness's uh, interpreter for many, many years. He's a, a great scholar and practitioner in his own right. Um, he defines compassion like this. He says, broadly defined, compassion is a sense of concern that arises when we're confronted with another's suffering and feel motivated to see that suffering relieved. And this book, which you're welcome to have a look at after the session, arose from a course designed by Tutan Jimpa called Compassion Cultivation Training. And the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education has been set up at Stanford University, which has helped to place the study of compassion squarely within established science and the reason I say this is that there are people who think that the study of compassion and loving kindness um, particularly for ourselves as being a bit fluffy or weak <coughs> but um, looking at His Holiness the Dalai Lama I think you can see that there's nothing weak about it. So <coughs> there are actually kind of two parts. So the first part is empathy, where we really feel for the suffering of others. When our hearts go out to someone or a group of people who are suffering, and we all know what this feels like, particularly in the world today. Um, and I'm often, I have been asked quite often, what do you do if you feel completely overwhelmed by the suffering of the planet? <coughs> Excuse me. So this is empathy, this feeling with is empathy, which leads to compassion. But if we stay too long in a state of kind of empathetic concern, then it can get easy, it can be easy to get overwhelmed and kind of get stuck there. <coughs> so compassion is a much more empowered state, uh, more than an empathetic response to a situation. Compassion empowers us to act, to do something to alleviate the suffering. And with it comes a feeling of agency that we are able to do something, no matter how small. And that might mean donating a very small amount to a cause that moves your heart, such as helping refugees or planting trees, whatever. Because not all of us can go to the Ukraine and really, you know, give that magnificent help. And compassion needs to be guided by wisdom because wisdom, compassion without wisdom, without knowing what's skillful actually to do, can end in making a big mess. Um, sometimes we think we know what's best for a person in distress without really checking what they want um, or what they need. And our intention can be to really help, but without true understanding of what's going on, without discerning wisdom, without the correct information, we can be kind of misguided. And I was thinking about what would be an example of this. Um, I was chatting with um, Dave <coughs> before I came here, and I said, what, what do you think will be a good example? And we, we both thought maybe um, if 
you know somebody um, who's got a difficult relationship with alcohol, for example, and they haven't got any and they're very distressed, well, idiot compassion will clearly be driving them to the, um, the booze shop and giving them 50 bucks, you know, because you think it's going to alleviate their suffering. Uh, another example um, that came up for me would be if you've got a friend who's a kind of um, anxious introvert and you think maybe they're not going out enough and you decide to invite 40 people around for a party, you know, that's maybe a good and nice intention to try and make them happy but misguided and not helpful. So you think about your own examples. Um, so the study of compassion and rigorous studies have been done suggest that our capacity for empathy, compassion, kindness and altruistic behaviour is inborn rather than acquired through socialisation or cultural exposure. <coughs> so it is an innate quality. So what is self-compassion? Um, or maybe we need to look at what it's not because there's so much misunderstanding. From both the Buddhist point of view and from research information, it's true that we're happier when we're less self-focused. So when we're more focused outwards to other people and to the world. Um, but self-compassion is totally different from narcissistic self-absorption. People who are truly self-compassionate take care of themselves while being interested still in the feelings and needs of those around them. So the physical and mental health that comes from being kind to ourselves gives us much greater capacity to take care of other people. So it's quite different from being self-centered or self-absorbed. And I know there have been times in my own life where I've been so caught up in my own distress that, you know, I couldn't even register what was happening with anybody else. <clears throat> so self-compassion self is not the same as self-pity because self-pity also makes us self-centered. Feeling sorry for ourselves, we become oblivious to the world around us. So it's like our awareness kind of shrinks to only the poor me and can't see beyond it. Self-compassion allows us to see our problems within the larger context of human experience, giving us a much more realistic sense of proportion that helps us to deal with our suffering in more constructive ways. So no matter, you know, no matter what happens to us, and we've all suffered um, damage and distress and difficult times. But no matter what happens to us, we can be sure that at that very moment, millions of other people on the planet are going through the same thing. <coughs> then self-compassion isn't self-gratification. So eating three tubs of Belgian chocolate custard ice cream is not necessarily the kindest thing to do when we're upset, uh, particularly if we're a diabetic, and nor is smashing three series of Games of Thrones, um, Game of Thrones in a row, which I've also done. Although it's equally important to not beat ourselves up if we go there. So self-compassion means that we relate to ourselves, especially our struggles, and our failures and our mistakes with understanding and with kindness and acceptance. As Jimpa puts it, it's a gentle, caring, clear-seeing, yet non-judgmental attitude and orientation of our heart and mind towards our own suffering and needs. So when we're kind to ourselves, we don't evaluate ourselves according to material success or good reputation and we don't compare ourselves with others. So we understand and accept our shortcomings with patience, understanding and kindness, just as we would with a friend. And we see our problems within the larger context of our shared human condition. 
So it lets us feel more connected with people rather than more isolated. Um, when we're kind of in a state of self-absorption, selfish self-absorption, that does lead to a feeling, a much greater feeling of isolation. Um, and we can see signs of lack of self-compassion everywhere we look. People stay in damaging relationships because they blame themselves for things not working. Um, people stay in jobs that they hate because, you know, they blame themselves for not getting along in the job. People, a really common one is people being uncomfortable with their bodies, with the way they look, and then taking extreme measures, you know, starving themselves or um, all the other things people do to try to fit a particular image. And then some people feel like frauds and live in fear of being found out that they're actually hopeless. And many of us are anxious and get depressed and blame ourselves for that too. And it's crazy and deeply unkind. In the studies around self-compassion training, people reported feeling uncomfortable even thinking about their own needs. And um, some people even had a negative reaction to some of the exercises um, where uh, some of you might be aware of an exercise, meta practice, where you wish yourself kindness, you wish yourself to be happy, and then you extend that practice out to others, which we'll, we'll do next week. But some people even had a negative reaction to that, to thinking, may I be happy, may I find peace, may I find joy. <coughs> so... What is self-compassion? Um, another book that I came across, it, it's excellent, it's called The Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook by Krista Neff and Christopher Germer. Um, Krista Neff is Associate Professor in the University of Texas at Austin's Department of Educational Psychology. And she received a doctorate from UCLA Berkeley studying moral development and she started the development of the Mindful Self-Compassion Project with Chris Germer, <clears throat> another psychologist who works in this field in 2010. So I've actually printed um, some resources for anyone who is interested to look at this a bit further. And also some instructions on walking meditation and they're um, just on that table there so you can help yourselves. Um, in the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook, they say self-compassion involves treating yourselves the way you would treat a friend who is having a hard time. Even if your friend has blown it or is feeling inadequate or is feeling, facing a, you know, a tough challenge. And typically we don't treat ourselves as well as we treat our friends. So imagine that your best friend calls you in great distress to tell you that their long-term partner has left for somebody else um, and they're completely devastated, com totally upset and needing some care. And you sigh and you say, well, to be perfectly honest, it's probably because you're old, ugly and boring and not mentioning needy and dependent, and I'd just give up now. Because there's no hope of finding anyone who's going to love you, and frankly, you don't deserve it. So, would we ever talk to somebody that we care for like this? You know, in this way? I mean, well, it might happen, but uh, most people... There's no way you would say that. But strangely, this is precisely how we can talk to ourselves in situations like this or worse. So Neff and Germer describe the three essential elements of self-compassion as being loving, so that's self-kindness, um, being connected, that's remembering our common humanity, and being present, and this is mindfulness. So we're in the, when we're in the mind state of loving, connected, present, 
presence, our relationship to ourselves, others and the world can really be transformed and it takes practice, it takes repetition again. Some of the benefits of self-compassion are that when we're kind to ourselves, when we attend to ourselves, look after ourselves, we renew our resources. So it's kind of like recharging our batteries and we know how to do it. We can advise other people how to do it. So we resource ourselves wisely by eating well, exercising, being kind, asking for help, taking holidays, you know, so important, taking breaks. And in this way we protect ourselves from burnout and pessim pessimism, you know, if we're facing tough times. I have um, a niece who works in emergency at Box Hill Hospital and I can tell you the nurses there and the doctors have been having a really dreadful time and she has to work very, very hard um, looking after herself, making sure she gets enough rest, making, getting massages, things like this with the motivation to be able to keep helping because so many people have left, so many nurses have left because they're burnt out and they can't handle it. So looking after ourselves and, and resourcing ourselves means that we can do more for others. Setting realistic goals. So when we're more in tune with our deepest needs and um, and our well-being and uh, our deepest wishes, how we want to be in the world. Um, rather than other people's expectations or what we imagine other people's expectations to be, if we think about it, then we tend to set goals that are more meaningful for us and more realistic. So maybe not so much money, but a job that we can you know, really live with ourselves. And learning from experience with um, self-care, being taking care of ourselves, we're less likely to get stuck in self-judgment and feeling hopeless when we experience setbacks. So self-compassion helps us to see that disappointments and mistakes are inevitable. You know, it's not our fault. And that frees us from the totally unhelpful belief that life should be free of disappointment and failure. And it helps us to feel less alone because instead of asking, why me, we see I'm not alone. So we've got a few minutes. Um, I'd like to finish with um, the three-step self-compassion practice. So are you happy to do that? If you um, feel it's a bit woolly or it's not your cup of tea, that's no problem. Um, you can maybe just focus on your breath or if you want to go, you're welcome to go. But it's a very, very, very helpful practice. And again, you have to um, be discerning and think about the, um, the qualities of the practice and how you might translate it into your own language. Because sometimes meditation practices have lang you know, language that might make you feel a bit cring cringy. Um, so you put it in your own language. Anyway, this is Chris Germer's three-step practice to soothe your problem with kindness. And all of the practices are actually in, <coughs> in this book. And um, uh, with the book, there's also, I think, um, keys into uh, websites where there's audio, so you can listen to it. OK. So sitting comfortably again. and bringing our mind into our bodies. And setting our intention that we have an open mind and maybe 
this practice can help us to be kinder to ourselves and so be more available for others. So just for a moment, think maybe about a, um, a problem you've really recently experienced and not one that's too difficult. So on a scale of one to ten, maybe a three. Just a, a problem that has made you pause, made you have difficult feelings, maybe anxiety. And uh, allow that situation to become clear in your mind. If nothing comes to mind, think maybe of one that might arise. And you say to yourself in a warm and understanding way internally, I'm experiencing difficulty. This is the mindful part of the practice. I'm feeling sad or anxious just as you might say when you're speaking with a dear friend. And you notice where in your body you feel it most. Do you feel it in your stomach, maybe at your chest, some tightness in the throat, maybe your heart beating more strongly or butterflies. And see if you can make a little room for that sensation, allowing it to be there, just allowing it to be there, if only for a few moments. So this is a kind way of being present to our actual experience, not making it go away, just acknowledging it. And then we contemplate our common humanity. So it might feel like you're the only person experiencing this pain but you can be assured that millions of people just as, feel just as you do in this very moment. We're connected. And we recognize, without diminishing our own pain, we recognize that many others if they were in the same situation as you, would feel just like you do. And we might think pain, sadness, anxiety are all part of the human condition and I'm not alone. And now we see if we can give ourselves some kindness. Very simply, because we're suffering. Maybe we're feeling anxiety. And we give ourselves kindness not to make the pain or the anxiety to go away, but to be with it as you would be with a friend. So you might think about, about someone who, who would be kind to you in this situation and imagine what that feels like, being held in presence. And soothing touch, so even placing one of your hands on the part of the body where you feel anxious 
And this actually works, it has an effect on the brain. So you might touch your heart or touch your belly and feel the weight of your hand. And see that as an expression of sympathy and kindness. And then we reflect for a moment on words that we'd like to hear most at that time. Like, for example, I'm here for you. You can do this. What words would inspire you to say, thank you, I needed to hear that? What would you like to hear? And you think of these words in your mind as soothing sounds. You might try repeating them internally. So at times we might take some time to practice self-kindness through being with the pain through soothing touch and gentle words, however it feels right for you. And just notice, just note if there is any change in the way you feel, if there is any comfort, there might be, there might not be, just notice. And finally, we can dedicate the positive energy of having made the effort to come and do some meditation, thinking how we can help ourselves and thinking how we can help other people, other beings and the planet. So we dedicate for the benefit of others. And when you're ready, you can relax your awareness. So we've gone a bit over. Um, I'm quite happy to answer questions if you have any, or if you're um, you want to go, you're most welcome to go, no problem. So, any questions? <coughs> I've just noticed that my, grand, my granddaughter put a Star Wars sticker on my computer. So... May the force be with me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Have a good week.